Good evening, everyone. No need to adjust your screens. Um, this is not Gareth that is doing the interview this week. This time, the, the tables have been turned, and now the interviewer becomes the interviewee this evening. Welcome, Gareth. Hello. Now, you've done this, what is it, 15 times now? 15 and times. Usually you've been in this comfortable position, kind of asking these probing, sometimes tricky to answer questions. Now, now you're at the receiving end. How's it? How are you feeling? I'm actually quite nervous. I can see how people have been nervous uh, when they've come on. I'm actually more nervous that you're going to do a better job asking the questions than me, and I'm going to have to sack myself. So um, now we'll see how it goes. Well, well, that's that's for others to decide. But for just now, um, let's just get stuck in, shall we? Tell us. Uh, as you've done with others, uh, what would be your ideal day? How would it start and finish? Well, it would be quite different from your ideal day in that it would probably involve as little exercise as is humanly possible, I would think. A bit of a lie-in in the morning, get to McDonald's just in time for the McDonald's breakfast, uh, bacon and egg McMuffin, extra hash brown, of course, Sorry, I said, I said your ideal day, not your normal day. <laughs> um, so sure. after that, I don't know, maybe a wee trip through to St Andrews or somewhere like that for a wander around. And obviously this would be a nice sunny day, so shorts and t-shirt, wander around St Andrews. Maybe watch some football in the afternoon. If it's the ideal day, it's Aberdeen beating Rangers or Celtic, um, which doesn't happen too often. And then probably some form of takeaway at night. How has what you do day in, day out changed as a result of COVID? How, how, how has your day-to-day -day activities been affected over the last six months or so? When we had the, the stricter lockdown, a lot of the activities that I would normally be involved in weren't happening, uh, just weren't possible. So it's been quite different. I mean, I, I quite like the challenge of coming up with new ideas and thinking a wee bit outside the box. So uh, I've enjoyed the challenge of it and it's opened up some different opportunities um, which has been good and in a sense we probably reached a, a whole new audience as well which is which is great uh, and, and this I suppose what we're doing just now is, is one example of how you've had to kind of think about things differently and, and adapt differently what what would you say just thinking about these one-to-ones you've done 15 of them so far this is the end of the, the second series maybe there'll be a third uh, the people the general feedback is that people enjoy them uh, is, there, is there any particular one other than last week, of course, which stood, stood out in particular for you? Yeah, well, it, it probably won't be this one anyway, I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> uh, that's a difficult question because I'm going to offend people if I, if I say what my favourite one was. It's been good to give people the opportunity to share a wee bit about their life and their faith. Um, and I think the reason maybe that they've gone down quite well is that people can relate to, to different people with different stories. So I think the first one that we did right back at the start with Hannah, enjoyed that. Um, I think because it was the first one, we weren't really too sure how it was going to go. And I think that kind of set the tone almost for them. Um, the other one that kind of stands out would be Verena's. Um, I thought that was, I only knew bits of, of her story. So a lot of that was new to me and it was really uh, interesting just to chat with her too. So obviously all of these you can go back and watch if you've not seen them. Just getting a wee plug there for the, the YouTube channel and the Facebook page. I think in order to to be true to the purpose of this, um, we need to maybe go back back to the start a little bit. So, so maybe you could take us uh, back in time and tell us about your your upbringing. You're you're not originally from Perth, no? Nope, no, nope, definitely not originally from Perth. I was uh, born in Aberdeen and I grew up in Elgin, um, not too far away from where you originated from. The memories I've got of my my childhood are really. Uh, really good ones, you know, it'd be my mum and my dad and my little sister arrived a couple of years uh, later and yeah, good memories, similar to yourself, uh, what you were saying last week, from as far back as I can remember, I was taken along to Sunday school and other services at Riverside Gospel Hall in Elgin. Was, was there a particular point you can think back to where y you maybe began to understand more about why uh, they were they were gathering and, and talking in the way they were and thinking more about the gospel and, and that kind of thing. Can you maybe take us through kind of 
how, how, the, how that happened and, and the point at which you became a Christian yourself? It was it was one Sunday evening, um, 10th of May, 1992, a uh, long time ago now, 28 years ago now. Um, but I can remember it, you know, as if it was yesterday. Um, just, I, I don't remember what the, the guy was speaking about in the service that night, but I remember the feeling that I had. And it was maybe what a lot of people say, you know, they, they felt like they were the only person in the room and that everything the speaker was saying was almost directed to to them. And that, that's how I felt that night. And although I'd probably heard the, the same things over and over again for years, that night it became personal and it became real. Um, and I understood that night that I was a, a sinner, someone who had broken God's rules and commandments and that that meant I deserved God's punishment. And in my simple understanding, I, I came to understand that that meant I wasn't going to be in heaven, I was going to be in hell. And I think the, the realisation of that just hit home to me that night. And I understood that I needed to, to get God's forgiveness, I needed to be saved. And that the only way that was possible was because Jesus Christ, God's son, had come into the world and he had died on the cross for me, for my sins. And it, it hit home to me that night. And... When I went home that evening, a kind of awkward little boy um, as I was, not good at speaking about important stuff. Um, I remember kind of loitering in the kitchen, um, wanting to to bring it up and just asking my mum eventually, you know, when when could I get saved or something along those lines. And then having a chat with her um, and then through in my bedroom, just praying and asking the Lord Jesus Christ to come into to my heart, into my life and to forgive my sins and and so on. So that was, it was very simple. I mean, I didn't have a, a great understanding of everything in the Bible, but it was just a very simple understanding that I was a sinner. Jesus Christ was the one who could save me and just to put my trust in him that night. So that's how it, how it happened. What things would you say maybe changed or, or even didn't change in your life afterwards as you, you know, became a, a 10 year old boy that was found it awkward to speak and moved into your teenage years? Yeah, I, I would say, that, you know, that particular night when I when I prayed and I'd asked Christ to come into my, my life and to take away my sins, there was a, a, there was a feeling of relief almost because I was worried about my sin and I was worried about, you know, this prospect of God's punishment and, and hell. So knowing that my sins were now forgiven, there was a, a sense of, uh, relief and a sense of peace and, and happiness that the whole thing was sorted and dealt with and I didn't have to worry about that anymore so there was a, there was that kind of feeling but it wasn't you know there was no kind of fireworks out in the, the sky and blinding lights or anything uh, spectacular in that sense and I don't know it, there, there maybe wasn't a dramatic transformation in, in my my life because as a, as a young boy I hadn't been in prison at that point um, hadn't uh, committed serious crimes or hadn't got any terrible habits that I needed to kick or anything like that. So there maybe wasn't a dramatic change at the time. Um, I, I still fought with my sister probably a bit too often <laughs> and so on. So there maybe wasn't a dramatic change at that point in time. And later on that year, we actually moved from Elgin down to Perth. That takes us nicely into uh, the, the teenage years. So you know, you, you, you were saved at a relatively young age, like nine years old, and uh, you then next year you moved you moved out to Perth. You're in a new, uh, a new, a new town, uh, going to a different school. Tell us a bit about teenage years as a Christian, and uh, you know the, the, the challenges that that brought. Once we moved out to Perth, th things were probably okay for maybe a year or two. Primary school. Getting into secondary school in the teenage years, things maybe um, weren't going so great spiritually because I, I suppose the main problem was I started to get sidetracked with other interests that I had. Um, the way that I sometimes put it is that my interests really became idols in my life um, and, and took my attention away from, from God. Um, and the, the big things for me, I suppose, at that age was probably football uh, for quite a number of years. That, that was... The, the big big thing for me, I got really 
involved in that and really interested in that. And then music was the, the thing after that, um, kind of mid to late 90s and the whole Britpop uh, scene that was on the go at that point, uh, that kind of drew me away and I got really into that as well. And I guess that the things that, that stop is, you know, you stop reading the Bible, you stop praying and you just become feel more distant from God and you become more wrapped up in other things and that is really the story of my my teenage years at school I suppose people might have known that I, I went to church but it wasn't really something I would have spoken to my friends about um, not that I was em embarrassed in a sense about going to church or anything I think maybe more um, what you were speaking about last week the fact that I would be dressed up in my shirt and tie and suit I was probably more embarrassed about that than anything else um but it wasn't something I would have really spoken to to my friends about and to be honest if you were to have seen me and my non-Christian friends at that point you probably wouldn't have been able to tell much difference and <laughs> just take us back to the you know, how, how football became uh, a, a bit of a big thing in your life because to, to myself and maybe others watching having seen you play on a Tuesday night no one really think that you played a lot of football when you were younger so so was that kind of a combination of, of playing football kind of supporting football Aberdeen watching them playing football games and can you think back to how it started out yeah I mean I think it's just really as you as you described there um just everything was about football you know you'd go into school early in the morning play football lunch break play football uh, after school, stick around a bit longer, play football, come home, go out the back garden and play football, come in, maybe watch football or play football on your computer. Um, I mean, I lost, I don't know how many, probably weeks worth of, or maybe months worth of my life playing championship manager, which uh, some folks who are watching might relate to. But you're just, just that, just completely taken up with something. And probably more so, actually, when I moved on from that to the, the music stuff, that was probably the thing that really drew me further away. How did you enjoy high school? Did you kind of develop uh, interests uh, from an academic point of view? Did you did you go on to further study? What, what happened there? I, I, I loved school, mainly because I got to play football and <laughs> muck about with my friends. I mean, that, uh, yeah, I, I, loved, I loved being at school. Um, but when when I finished, I mean, I didn't really have any particular interests academically. I mean, I did I did fairly well at school, got decent exam results, and then went off to to university after that, um, and did I suppose what you would call a kind of general degree that people do that don't really know what they want to do with their life, which uh, was business management. So I went off to St Andrews University in 2001, um, stayed in Halls of Residence, um, which you I mean you would think maybe in St Andrews that would be quite grand, but <laughs> it was a sort of glorified prison that I think I was staying in um, in that first year. <laughs> I had a, a, a wee room down the very bottom. You had to actually go downstairs to get to it. It looked out onto a wall at the back, so there was hardly any light got in. Um, sharing a, a bathroom with I think about 10 other guys it was yeah um it wasn't it wasn't a great experience um so yeah that was that was first year and then after that I was traveling back and forward were there any options for Christian company fellowship churches while you were in St Andrews where, where, where was your kind of interest lying at this point in relation to that I didn't actually know anybody when I went there um and I didn't really get overly involved in student life uh, which I think is probably a probably a good thing in the in the end I spent most of that first year just sleeping I think in my my room <laughs> not doing not doing a huge amount not going to many yeah, classes yeah, the wall. just staring out at the wall yeah um and not not going to many classes either but you know, generally speaking I, I went through the university years not really with much spiritual interest and probably as a result of that not really much interest in anything I mean I, I, I didn't have any direction as far as life was concerned um, at all you know I didn't know what I was going to do at the end of, of uni which is probably something that meant I wasn't very motivated at uni um, in terms of studying or 
doing a huge amount of work. You're studying a, a fairly generic degree that you don't really see what's there at the end of it all. Um, you're, you're not really going to classes at what is one of the most prestigious universities in the country. And, and you're also rubbing shoulders with one or two folk who um, are pretty famous, right? Yeah, well, Prince William's claim to fame is that he was in my class <laughs> for a couple of years at, at university. So, um, yeah, he was in he was in some of the classes. You didn't get any sort of chat with him about maybe kind of working together or anything like that. Any 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 interesting conversations that you're at liberty to share? I'm not sure what he would have employed me to do. <laughs> um, no, no, the, the, the nearest we got was maybe if he was going in before me or I was going in before him, you would hold the door open and say thanks. That was about the extent of our interactions, I think. Right, and, and he would have had some sort of security detail with him whenever he went. Did you kind of, did that, was, was it pretty obvious or was, was that a bit more... A bit more subtle. It was, uh, it was quite subtle. You wouldn't really have noticed any security with him. You, you would sometimes see him wandering about in the, the town on his own with no obvious uh, security around him. So no, he, he was just like any other mm -hmm. St Andrews student. He, he kind of fitted in quite well, whereas I was uh, a bit of an oddity at St Andrews. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we, we need to remember that the interview is about you, not about the um, future heir to the throne. So how did you get from kind of starting your degree to, to finishing it? And then what happened after that? Yeah, so I, I somehow get through the, the degree. Um, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how. It's a, a bit of a miracle that I ever managed to get a degree. Um, I was almost going to give up after third year, actually. Um, I had an application form filled in. For a, for a job just in a call centre in Perth. I, I stuck it out for the, the fourth year, got the degree. And then after that, was applying for, for graduate jobs. Like I said, I didn't know really what line of work I wanted to go into. My degree was quite a general business studies type thing. So just applying for graduate jobs and nothing really was coming off. Um, I'd worked the previous summer in SSE call centre. Um, after a wee while, nothing else was coming off, so I ended up going back um, into there, which I thought was just going to be a temporary thing while I applied for, for other jobs, and uh, I ended up staying with SSE for 10 years. Just generally, what, what kind of stuff did you do there? Well, the first year was um, in the call centre, which was... <laughs> it would be difficult to put into words how mind-numbingly boring the job was that I was doing there. Um, I'll just, just as an example, folks who are watching or maybe have experience of sending in their, their meter readings, electricity and gas readings to, to their energy supplier. Well, back in back at that time, what you did was you, you would phone it in and you would leave your details and your meter readings on an answer phone. And at the other end, there would be me listening back to the answer phone and typing the numbers into the computer uh, all day, every day for about a year. So that was uh, that was not not great. Um, so I, I started applying for other jobs internally, and eventually got a, a job across in the corporate um, side of the business about a year after. And that was a that was a good good job actually. I went from listening to the answer phone all day to ending up being in sort of board meetings with the, the chief executive and the different directors of the, the company, um, completely out of my depth, um, trying to, to understand what they were talking about. So I, I, I then had a few different jobs within the corporate side of the business, mostly in corporate uh, communications, internal communications and that type of thing. You, you reached a point where I suppose there was a turning point in all of this. And that was probably the, the catalytic event that took you to, to where you are now. So could you maybe tell us about that and, and, and what any circumstances that led up to that point and, and what it, how, how that change 
in, I suppose, priority and, and outlook and, and, and spiritual interest all came about? Yeah, looking back, it was 2006, so I finished uni in 2005. I was doing the dead-end uh, job for a year after that, and I think that probably had a part to play in it, um, to be honest. Just coming out of uni and not knowing really, you know, what, what I was going to do with, with my life, I suppose, not really having any particular ambition or direction, I think that started really playing on my mind at that point, that, you know, there's, there's got to be more to life. And I think that probably fed into a bit of a resurgence in interest spiritually. Um, probably one or two other things as well, which we can't really remember fully, but I, I started to read the Bible again and God started to speak to me through that um, and started to really challenge me about how I was living my life and about really coming back to, to him, I suppose. Um, and the, the first step really was to get baptised. I mean, I'd known about that for, for years and years. That as a Christian, I ought to have been baptised. And from the age of nine, I didn't get baptised till I was 23. So that was a, a big thing. Almost the longer you put it off, the more difficult it becomes. Um, so that was the first step. And at the same time, I became a member of the the church and from there really kind of threw myself into things and tried to make up for lost time I suppose that was the the turning point. Mm -hmm. And and from that point you mentioned you, you got involved in more things. I think maybe a week or two after I got baptised I went to the that Christian youth camp and that was my first taste I suppose of being involved in serving God and uh, that was a great experience. So I, I did the camps for quite a number of years after that. Started to get involved in things like the uh, the junior Bible class, helping out at that at the hall uh, with the teenagers there. Um, and then on, on, on from that, really getting involved in uh, literature distribution and uh, a wee bit of preaching and just gradually different opportunities opened up and you try this and that. And some things I found I was absolutely horrendous at. Um, so stopped doing them fairly quickly. Uh, other things seem to have a bit of, of gift at and continue doing them. And I suppose there was people who took me under their wing a little bit in Perth and showed me the ropes as far as Christian work was concerned. So, you know, all of those things together, I just got more and more involved and very quickly started to be spending pretty much all of my free time um, involved in Christian work. So that purpose that I hadn't really had in my life, uh, I now had it and found it and realised this is this is what God wants me to be to be doing. Could you take us through how you came from from that point to ultimately um, doing what you're doing just now? What, what's often called an individual's calling to serve the Lord? How did that How did that process happen? Yeah. So o over the years, I suppose. As I say, getting more and more involved in serving God in different ways, people beginning to mention to me the possibility of serving God full time. And I guess for for a number of years before it actually happened, it was there at the back of my mind. And I began to almost become quite sure that this is the way that, that God was, was leading me in my life. I never felt it was the right time to take that step, but um, I started making preparation for it by moving into the the area um, where we where we've been working so moving out of my parents house moving into uh, this area and um, reducing my hours at work so down to four days a week down to three days a week so I could spend more time um, serving God and there was other things that were sort of happening as well so I remember one year going for my annual appraisal um, at SSE this was maybe about five maybe six years before I eventually left there to serve God full time. And I remember my my manager at the time, uh, when we came to the bit about asking about the future, he, he was he asked me, you know, do you think you'll be here next year? I said, well, I don't, what do you mean by that? He said, do you think you'll you'll have left to to work with the church, as he put it? 
um, before next year. So, you know, things like that, even people at work were beginning to to wonder if eventually I would I would leave and, and take that step. And, and that, I suppose, spoke to me a wee bit. There was um, another incident as well where um, after I had dropped down to, to three days a week at work, uh, one day there was a, a letter came through um, in the post and it was a, a gift, a financial gift from uh, a Christian man down uh, in the south of England who had, I'd never met him in my life before, I had no idea who this, this man was and he had just heard you know about about me and about some of the work that I was doing and the fact that I had made the sacrifice of reducing my hours at work and he wanted to send me a gift to support me and that again spoke to me that you know God will meet meet your need um, if you take this step but what really kind of brought it to a head was things were things were kind of gathering a bit of pace in terms of my, my thinking on it but there was a man who moved to Perth called Peter Brandon, who, who some of the viewers might uh, remember, um, a great man of God, uh, an evangelist who had you know, done great things for God for many, many decades. And he moved to Perth and we became quite, quite close and uh, he, he became quite ill. He was in the cancer hospice and Peter wasn't going to be coming back out of the, the hospice. We, we knew that he was just in the last few days or weeks of his, his life and I'd spoken to him about all these things we prayed together about it and so on um, and I read this verse in Joshua chapter 1 that spoke about it was God speaking to Joshua who was the younger man and Moses the older man the great servant of God had just died and God says to Joshua uh, Moses my servant is dead now it's time for you to get up and and go and get to work almost and you know, I just spoke right into the the situation and the circumstances, and I knew that that was the right time to take the step. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of how it happened. That was back at the beginning of, well, that was the end of 2015, and it was the beginning of 2016 that I eventually left SSE. And yeah, I did. I, I should say as well, I did enjoy the job that I was doing at SSE at that point. And I, I love the folks that I worked with too. And it was nice when we had a kind of leaving meal and they'd got me a, a present and it was sort of Bible books and, and so on. And I just remember being a bit of a, an emotional wreck at that uh, lunch. It was quite embarrassing, actually. So for people who maybe would expect someone in your position doing what you're now doing associated with Perth Gospel Hall... Can you explain why uh, you're not wearing a white collar? You're not called Pastor Gareth or, or Reverend Gareth. Tell us in summary and in, in short terms, kind of what your what your job description is. <laughs> um, you... I, I'm not I'm not wearing a white collar because I absolutely hate wearing shirt and tie anyway at the best of times. So that would be the last thing I'd be wanting to do. But um, yeah, so so we would understand from the Bible that, you know, the, the Bible doesn't really speak about uh, ministers and pastors who are employed by churches and who are professionally trained and so on. We, we would understand that people are called by God and they step out in faith and they are, they are provided for by, by God. So, you know, the, the way that I operate, I'm not... Uh, I'm not an employee of Perth Gospel Hall. I'm a servant of God, and God therefore meets my my financial needs, um, as it were. If that's the question, God will not just provide for you practically, but also give you guidance and direction in the areas of work from a a, a spiritual perspective that that you should be focused on. Is, is that is that how you see it? It's what God puts upon your your heart, and that's that's kind of how I operate. So, what God's put upon my heart at the moment is to to serve Him locally in Perth and Perthshire, and to share the gospel with people and to to find different ways to do that. And uh, lots of different opportunities have opened up 
um, for doing that over over the years. Take us through, you know, what, what would be a typical week or a month for you? And I don't know if you want to break it down to pre-COVID, post-COVID, because obviously a lot's changed since then. Yeah, that's... Uh, Oh, well, I don't know if there is such a thing really as a typical <laughs> week. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, there are regular activities. So we would have a couple of soup kitchens that we run um, a couple of days a week. So there's a lot of kind of preparation for that practically and um, so on. And then there would be, sometimes we would have over the summer months, the football outreach um, on another day. Uh, sometimes we would have Bible study groups in the evenings to, to plan and prepare for. Uh, coming into the weekends, you would have uh, more often than not some preaching engagement, either Saturday night or a Sunday, um, either in Perth or somewhere else. Um, and then on top of that, there, there, would, there would be a host of other activities. So there would be literature distribution, visitation work, meeting up with various different contacts that you've you've made through the different activities um, so no I would say no no two weeks are, are the same but they would probably comprise of the same elements are there things that you you'd, you'd involved in or you have been involved in uh, in in what you're doing that you not so much you think you're not good at or, or better at but more things that you may be enjoy uh, more than others or, or things that perhaps you you find more difficult than others as well I, I, I don't I don't feel that I'm particularly great at anything um, which is <laughs> maybe a slightly strange thing to say but the, the things that I enjoy are getting out and about and meeting people so for example the, the soup kitchens uh, you know I, I, I enjoy that work it's not it's not easy work it's difficult but mm-hmm. um, I, I enjoy it I enjoy being out and presenting the gospel to groups of people who are not Christians and engaging with them and getting to know them. And uh, so similarly with the, the football outreach. Um, so I enjoy that side of things more than preaching in the gospel hall, standing on a platform almost. Um, and I enjoy the, the local aspect of the work that I do more than going elsewhere preaching where I don't really know the the people. Has anything jumped out that you kind of think wow I, I, I didn't expect that or, or you're thinking maybe if I'd known I was going to be doing that then I might not have you know I might have given it a second thought. Or, has, 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 have there been any moments like that at all? I think when when I first went into it maybe what I had in mind was that it would be nicely structured and I think when I first started, it probably it was a quite a steep learning curve. But when I first started, I, I tried to plan out my week in great detail. So I had a, a kind of spreadsheet thing, and I had every half hour almost accounted for. And I thought it, that that's how it was going to work out. And I thought, you know, I'm going to need to be really, really disciplined about making sure that I follow this routine every week. But uh, I soon came to realise that that just wasn't ever going to work because things just cropped up and came in and happened every day and your your schedule that you had planned was just all over the place after you know by the time you got to Tuesday and it was really really frustrating so I, I had to change the the approach to it um fairly fairly quickly. I take it there's there's multiple examples where you're kind of getting emails, texts, calls at various hours and you're 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 compelled to to respond and 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 help out in whatever way you can yeah that i think particularly over the last few months that's been even more so the case um people struggling with the the current situation that, that we're in and the lockdown and so on um and i suppose one of the things that i wasn't really prepared for or expecting is is how you have to almost become so many different things to different people. You know, people r- rely on you and come to depend on you and want a bit of your time for, for all sorts of different things. Some things that you're really not prepared for and not qualified for in a sense as well. I, I'd find that very tiring. Do you, do you find there's points where you, you do need to try and switch off, whether that's go on a break somewhere, take a weekend out, how, how do you react in those kind of situations or 
you, you tend to find the energy levels are always pretty high. And yeah, how, how does how do you find that? I think my energy levels are generally always pretty low. But <laughs> um, I think I think yeah, that that's one of the that is one of the challenges for me. And I think maybe especially because it's the work that I do is really locally based. So you know the people that you come into contact with, you do get to know them better than if you're you know traveling about the country to different places and so on so you know even to think about the soup kitchen over the years there's over 500 different people have come to that the football group over like 300 different people have come to that mm -hmm. through various other outreaches there's probably hundreds of other people that have come across in one way or another and not not all of these people are getting in touch with me um which is probably just just as well but you know, quite there's quite a number of people who call on you for different things and yeah, like right. I said earlier it's not nine to five and then you kind of forget about it um it's what whatever time and you know just even as an example last night there was three different folks in touch all with different issues and problems and it's it is very difficult to try and help all these different situations at the same time and one thing that is a challenge is getting the balance, like you say, with having a bit of a, a rest and a break and time to recharge is, is, mm -hmm. is, is difficult. Now, we're coming to the end of this and, and there's still a few things that I think um, uh, our, our viewers would want to find out about Gareth Edwards. Uh, so, uh, again, borrowing a, a question you've asked others, if the, if the Gareth Edwards of 2020 could maybe go back in time to um, maybe just before the millennium uh, and meet uh, Gareth, Adward, Gareth Edwards, a teenager. What would he? What would he say to him? I think he would have to have some pretty stern words with him. Actually, he might actually just need to take him round the round the back and give him a kick. In I think <laughs> kick some sense into him. I don't know. Um, I don't know whether the, the Gareth Edwards of um, nineteen ninety nine or whatever would have even listened anyway um, so he might have been wasting maybe wasting my time going back and speaking to him but I think the big the big thing for me is just I, I would probably tell him get your priorities right looking back I, I now see it as just completely wasted years because the things that I was interested in are not mm. you know they're no substitute for for, for what you can have um, as a Christian you know living the Christian life the way that you're you're meant, it's meant to be lived and enjoying that relationship with God that you that you have. Um, you know, you're really settling for second best if you're pursuing other things over and above that. And I, I wish, I suppose, that I could have seen that at the time. Um, I guess you always sort of think the grass is greener on the other side and you want to go and experience things and just but actually you only come to realise that it's it just leaves you empty at the end of it all. There's more to life than football and music and hobbies and interests. There's more to life than um, study and career and jobs. The, the, the big thing in life is actually your relationship with God and the purpose that that brings. And I think if I'd maybe grasped that a bit sooner and a bit earlier, things might have been a wee bit different, but I think that's what I would tell him. Is there a particular Bible verse that would be important to you? One, one, one that one that stands out that you've had had in the past or you used a lot, come across a lot. I think one that that generally has meant a lot to me over the years is uh, Philippians four and verse thirteen. It's actually on my wall, um, just up here in my living room, and it says, "I can do all things through Christ." Who strengthens me you know often in serving God pretty much all the time in serving God I feel inadequate and I feel insufficient and I feel like I wonder sometimes why God has chosen me to do some of these things and I always feel you know there's, there's surely better people than me that could be could be doing this and mm -hmm. I, I have to remind myself that yeah that's right that in my own strength I can't 
do any of the things God's asking me to do. But it's not in my own strength. It's in the strength that he pours into me. And so that's that's a verse that I often think about. Great. Well, look, Gareth, that is, uh, that's been a really insightful uh, one-to-one. And I think our viewers will have really enjoyed seeing the tables turned. Uh, some may may take this to have been the case of um, waiting for the best until last. But for just now, this is the last in the second series. And I think I'll say thank you uh, on behalf of you for uh, everyone who's been able to tune in and watch. Please leave a comment. And I'll maybe just hand back over to you to, to wrap things up. Thanks very much. We've made it made it through to the end. Um, and I think I am I'm kind of fearing for my job now because I think you've done a much better job than I normally do <laughs> asking the questions. That was a pretty serious interrogation there. So thanks very much for doing that. Appreciate it. Um, thanks to everyone who has watched this video and uh, the previous ones in the series as well. I don't know whether we'll be back for another series. Um, it might depend on what the the public demand is so if you want more interviews like this in the future let us know and we'll see what we can do but for now thanks again for watching and goodbye and god bless mm -hmm.